Welcome back. People of color have historically faced greater barriers when learning to swim. Recent stats show about 26% of black parents and 32% of Hispanic and Latino parents never learned to swim. That's compared to less than 4% of white parents. Elise Preston tells us how one man in Los Angeles is trying to change all that by offering lessons in his own backyard pool. This isn't your usual swim class. So take your time and back your steps and go slowly. And Conrad Cooper isn't your typical instructor. Why are you kicking so fast? Are you in a hurry? You have a date or something? For three decades, the 70 year old has been juggling tens of thousands of little ones, teaching them to swim in this backyard saltwater pool. It was about getting kids who initially looked like me to get comfortable in the water. Diversity in aquatics is lacking. Cooper took note when his own nieces started swim lessons 30 years ago. So he dove into teaching. Do you think the fact that you are black, do you think that helps the children trust you a little bit more, that it helps the families trust you? Absolutely. Often they've been someplace else, they weren't treated quite the same way, in a different kind of environment, not like this. That reflection is desperately needed in a world where children of color face greater safety risks in water. When you look at the numbers, black children are seven times more likely to drown in a pool. Absolutely. That's heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking. And I'm helping to get them uh, out of that particular situation where they are now safe and comfortable in the water. A heartbreak Cooper's wife and business partner, Londa Parks, knows. Her own brother drowned when she was just a toddler. He was just eight years old and he didn't know how to swim. Cooper's presence puts both four-year-old Bodie and his father at ease. You better stay there. <laughs> Him, I think he could view Conrad as like an uncle. It's a reflection of how I grew up and what you know, and how I learned to swim. Davina Jackson's children inspired her to take the plunge at 37 years old. It was an amazing feeling, like I don't have to have the fear that something's gonna happen. When you look at how many people of color around the country are not swimming, mm -hmm. what is your biggest hope? That they continue to find somewhere where they can have access to a pool and learn better swim lessons in communities that are underserved. While it took some coaxing at first, this group of kids ended the week with some smiles and a sense of achievement. Elise Preston, CBS News, Los Angeles. When you call 911, you expect the ambulance to rush you to the hospital. However, when it comes to extreme heat illness, doing that could actually jeopardize a life. National recommendations call for cooling patients first before transporting them. But as David Schechter reports, only a few states are following this protocol. Lots of ice. When you stack up Matt Willens against most paramedics, he has one more life-saving tool for patients overcome by the blazing Texas heat. Matt carries that ice with him every day in case there's a call for heat stroke. I'm going to be part of the crew here for a little bit and learn how they do this, how they cool a patient down on the spot. I count of three, one, two, three, up and move over. I help Matt put the patient in a bag. We can start dumping this on him. Pour in water. Literally just dump the bucket of ice over Dump him. the bucket of ice on him. Pour in Matt's ice. Really, it's just like, it's very simple. Yes. Um, now we're, we're treating them in the field and making that difference. And that's could save their life. That is going to save their life. The protocol is known as cool first, transport second. The National Association of EMS officials recommends if a patient's core temperature is above 104, an ice bath immersion provides the most rapid cooling mechanism. Only after the temperature falls to 102.2 should the patient be transported to the hospital. It's a life-saving intervention that's more critical than ever as climate change makes our summers hotter and hotter. Tell me about, tell me about Zach. I love talking about Zach. <laughs> For his age, he was always very big and gentle and kind and funny. They called him Big Zach. And during football practice in 2017, Zach's body temperature hit 107 degrees. When the ambulance arrived, he was unresponsive and moaning. I just remember the panic that was setting in in that moment. Mm -hmm. They were just assessing him and then loading him up. To the instinct is, let's get to the hospital. Load and go. But when a patient is overheated, the national recommendation is not load and go, 
It's cool first, transport second. However, across the country, only 11 states require ambulance services to follow that life-saving protocol. Zach died from organ failure 11 days after he collapsed. His mom believes if cool first transport second had been followed, he might have survived. You know, as a mother, that first heartbeat is really important to hear on the sonogram. I heard his last heartbeat too. I am Lori Giordano. I am Zach Martin's mom. After years of advocacy, Lori worked with the Florida legislature to pass what they named the Zachary Martin Act, a law requiring, among other things, on-site ice baths at all outdoor athletic events in Florida. But she's not stopping at high school sports. She wants all of the nation's ambulances to cool heat victims on the spot. If we can get the first response to be cool, then, then that's going to be where, where the lives are saved. In a world that's getting hotter, this is a life-saving solution that's not required in most of the country. I'm David Schechter for CBS News. That's this week's Eye on Health. I'm Michael George. Thanks for joining us and be well.